Hi everyone. So I've had my electric car about seven months at this point, and I think I've learned what affects it and what probably doesn't affect it in terms of its range. So I thought it was time to discuss my findings with new EV owners here. So we start today inside my Renault Zoe. There are a few controls in here that I want to go through that make a difference to the car's range. We start over here with the eco button, this one here. What the eco button does is it limits the car's top speed to 64 miles an hour. It dulls the throttle response so that you're less likely to use as much power. And it reduces the capability of the climate control. It turns down the climate control. And all of those can have a bit of a difference to your range, but not all that much. The next one is down here. At the moment I'm in B mode, as if it's in engine braking in a traditional combustion engine car. B mode allows me to regenerate energy when I need to come to a stop, just by lifting off the accelerator. I get more regen by pressing the brake pedal. So the maximum regen the car will do is in, in the high 40 kilowatts, but um, I get about 27, 28 kilowatts of regen just by lifting off the accelerator and doing nothing else. So that can recoup a bit of energy, but of course bear in mind that it's better not to use the energy at all than to use it and then to recoup it because regeneration isn't 100% efficient. So what else have we got in here that makes a difference? Well, the climate controls will make a difference. Turning the air conditioning off completely, although Eco will dull it a little bit, turning it off completely will make the most difference. That ensures that no energy is being used by the air conditioning at all, although it may be used for heating the cabin still. So setting the temperature of the inside of the cabin to approximately where it already is will mean that the least amount of energy is used as possible. What else have we got? Well, there's not a lot down here that will work, except for that one there. That's the most powerful control you have in terms of controlling how much energy the car uses, the accelerator pedal. In two regards. Firstly, that the more you press it, the more energy you're using instantaneously. Secondly, the faster you go, the more energy you're using. So reducing the amount that you're speeding up will be the biggest contribution you can make to the efficiency of the car. We can make dramatic savings to the amount of energy we use on a journey just by changing our speed. The amount of force generated by air resistance increases with the square of our speed. Indeed, the amount of power that we use to overcome air resistance increases with the cube of our speed. However, the amount of time over which we expend that energy is less the faster we go. So it's more like a squaring of speed that is important here. As we can see from this table, reducing our speed from 70 miles an hour to 65 miles an hour, we will use up to 11% less energy for our journey. If we reduce our speed from 70 miles an hour to 63 miles an hour, then we will use up to 15% less energy for our journey. The total energy that we use for our journey will be dependent upon the average speed rather than the maximum speed. However, capping the maximum speed that we reach is one way of reducing the overall energy usage because it also reduces our average speed across the journey. So you might be wondering at this point, do I drive like an old man? Do I drive um, without enjoying the car and pottering around very slowly at this point? Well, as it happens, no. My old Smart 4.2 used to overread its speed by quite a lot at high speeds. When I was doing just under 70 miles an hour that's displayed on the Speedo, I was actually doing about 63 miles an hour GPS speed. So as it happens, when I'm using this technique, I'm not going any slower than I used to go. It's just that the Speedo uh, is more accurate in a newer car. 
Now, of course, this may be different for you if you're upgrading from a newer car. But the point is, you don't have to do this all the time. If you have a very long leg of a road trip, or you're trying to get somewhere with a fixed amount of energy without having to recharge, then you can use this knowledge in order to achieve that goal. But you don't have to do it everywhere. Let me give you a real world example of how this works. Yesterday, I was driving back from Swindon. I joined the M4 eastbound at junction 15. At that point, there were 34 miles to Moto Reading services where I wanted to charge, and I had 58 miles displayed estimated range. So that's a positive delta of 24 miles. However, I soon got warning signs on that journey. My remaining range quickly dropped to a positive delta of only 13 miles, at which point I was a little bit uncomfortable, just in case the car was still using more energy than I was expecting. This was mainly due to a large uphill section, in fact a couple of sections, early on in that part of the M4. We gain about 350 metres elevation over a few miles at that point. But it was also because I'd been doing 70 on the way to Swindon earlier in the day and the car was probably estimating based upon me doing that kind of speed. So I took a few immediate actions. Firstly, I turned off the aircon completely because I didn't need it at that point. Then I turned on eco mode to eke out as much as I could of the car. I set the speed limiter to 56 miles an hour and eventually I pulled up behind a lorry, some short distance from a lorry, and dropped my speed to 53 miles an hour in order to match the lorry's speed. Now I didn't do that in order to try and draft the lorry in order to gain a benefit from aerodynamics. You have to get very close to the lorry in order to do that and that's not really safe. But the point is that I was not inconveniencing people who were using the motorway because they would already have to pull out of the slow lane if that's the lane they were using to overtake the lorry. So I didn't feel bad that I was also doing the same speed as the lorry. I was not inconveniencing people any more than already was happening as a result of the presence of the lorry doing our work and carrying our goods to its destination. So slowly over that journey the positive delta quickly grew to 20 miles by the time I passed Cheveley services and indeed I arrived with 23 miles estimated remaining when I got to Reading. So theoretically I'd gained back 10 miles estimated over about 30 miles distance but that is theoretically. There was a helping hand here in that there was some very slow traffic in roadworks between junction 12 and junction 11. It was very slow and we were crawling along at a few miles an hour which uses pretty much no energy in an electric car. Getting stuck you see in traffic in an electric car makes the car more efficient rather than less efficient as happens in an internal combustion engine car. It's also true to say that after you've done that big elevation change on that part of the motorway, it also then drops back down again after that range of hills, although it does so quite slowly. So that would also have helped. I reckon I won back about three miles in that very slow traffic. And so overall, I got a seven mile recovery in my estimated range. However, this is estimated range. I reckon my real range change, my real range uh, improvement would probably have been about three or four miles. So I was using less energy and so I would have a little bit more range. But the car was also changing the way it was predicting because I was using less energy. And that's why I think the estimated range went up more than was probably really true. However, if you find yourself in this position where you're a bit uncomfortable amount of, about the amount of energy you've got left in order to finish the leg of a journey, then you have the power to affect the outcome just by slowing down. As it happens on this particular trip, I was never in danger of running out of energy. Both the memory and the Cheveley services were fallback options for me because I'm sure I should, could charge at either of those as well. Reaching Reading services was a goal, not a need, based upon the fact that I wanted to see the new high power charging installation that's gone in quite recently. But it's best to have alternatives planned where possible for a journey. 
just to have in the back of your mind. You don't have to panic about creating multiple alternatives. Just have one place where you can, um, you can have a full back position where you go, no, I'm a bit uncomfortable. I'll charge a bit earlier than I intended. Remember that the range indication in the car is an estimation. We call this the guesso meter and it's called that for a reason. What it's trying to do is measure the exact energy available from the battery at any point in time and then predict your range based upon what energy it thinks you will use up until the end of the journey and both of those things are quite hard. The Renault Zoe is pretty accurate from what I can see but I wouldn't trust it into the single digit miles remaining. I don't think that that countdown is absolutely accurate in any car. It will be pretty close, but it won't be absolutely accurate. And that is why in some cars, they actually blank out the display when you get into very, very low states of charge. What the car is doing at that point is saying, your guess is probably as good as mine at this point, when you're getting down to six, five, four miles remaining. What I recommend you do therefore, if you think you've got a problem, is act early and decisively in order to gain extra range. Make that speed change early, make it bigger than you think you need, get your positive delta back in the amount of range you need for the distance that you're going to travel, and then you can speed up again if you'd like to. One extra word of warning, and that's that it's my belief that the 12 volt accessory battery is probably not charged in most cars when the traction battery is at a very low state of charge, probably below about 20%. So you can end up in a situation where if you run out of charge and then want to leave your lights on at the side of the road, you're gonna flatten the 12 volt battery pretty quickly. And that's because it was already depleting during the journey as you reach that low state of charge. So bear that in mind, Obviously, we never want to run out anyway, but just consider that if you're going below 10% or something like that, then that 12 volt battery is not going to last quite as long as you expect. Just keep that in mind because some people seem not to understand that very well. So we learned actually quite an interesting approach to long journey legs from a channel that's existed for a long time on YouTube and which you might like to check out if you haven't done already. The channel is called Aloam. This is by a Scottish minister who lives in Aberdeen and he had a 22 kilowatt hour Zoe with a range of about 90 miles on a good day. He had that car for a very long time and used the full range of the car. He used it as his main car while the family car was often used by his wife. As he learned about the car, he developed an interesting strategy, which I think we can all benefit from. And that is that if you're doing a journey where the amount of energy you have, your estimated range is very close to the distance that you want to do, then start slowly and then speed up once your delta is sufficiently positive. You can use the early part of the journey in order to learn exactly how much energy the car is going to use on the journey and then speed up when you have plenty. So there are a couple of other things we can do in order to save energy, which I wanted to just touch on. These are listed in order of decreasing effect. So in other words, the first one that I mentioned is the most effective. Well, we talked earlier about the car having to work very hard to overcome air resistance at high speed. So the top thing you can do is to remove any external accessories from the car when they're not needed, particularly things like roof racks and roof boxes. If you don't need them on the car, then take them off because those will make quite a big difference to the air resistance that the car suffers. The next one is probably to look ahead. When we're in traffic, what we're trying to do is predict when we'll need to stop and not accelerate and then have to decelerate hard and brake and lose a lot of energy. Don't accelerate if you think you're going to need to slow down again very quickly. However, if you have sped up and then the traffic situation changes, then just regenerate that energy. Regeneration is not 100% efficient. It's probably down something like 70 or 60% efficient, but you are at least going to draw some of that energy back for reuse at a later point. 
The next thing we can do is to keep our tyre pressures up to the manufacturer's recommended pressures. Now this isn't going to make a massive amount of difference, but it does affect rolling resistance. And rolling resistance um, is a factor, although it's less and less a factor at a higher speed. So it's worth keeping an eye on your tyre pressures, check them every once in a while, in order to be safe and also to be as efficient as possible. Getting into the smaller things we can do at this point, you should manage your heat use of the heating and the aircon of the cabin. This doesn't make a massive amount of difference and certainly your winter range doesn't drop through the floor because you're heating the cabin, at least not if you've preheated it. Preheating is probably the most beneficial of the things you can do, preheating or pre-cooling while you're plugged in, before you get into the car, before you unplug it, because then um, you've overcome the kind of thermal energy that needed to be uh, put into the car in order to change its temperature in the first place and all you're having to do after that point is maintain it which uses much less energy. Remember that heated and cooled seats use less energy than heating and cooling the cabin as a whole so use those if you have them in order to keep yourself more comfortable without significantly changing the temperature of the cabin. However, heating does not have as dramatic an effect as other people seem to think, I don't think. Finally, your lights and wipers probably don't make much difference, particularly if you've got LED lighting. So don't worry about those, they're not significant. Okay, well that's it for this video. Your comments and questions are most welcome. Put them down in the section below if you'd like to. If you found this video useful, then please click the thumbs up button. That tells YouTube that it's valuable and should be promoted to others who might enjoy it. And of course, click subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks.